there was one man who believed uh, that there was an inland sea, and that was Charles Sturt. And there he is, Charles Sturt. I've got to know Sturt really well. I've read his private papers, I've read his diaries, I've read his letters to his wife. I'm obsessed with him. You know, we, we, we think of the explorers as all being sort of the same guy, don't we? Um, uh, as though Sturt and Mitchell and Gregory and all the rest, Stuart and all the rest of them were just all variations on the explorer, all with a big hat on a horse. In fact, explorers are like extreme athletes. They're, they're sort of bonkers. You know, they're people of very unusual psychological makeup, with a very unusual take on life, and they're all quite different. And Sturt is an evangelical Christian. He's been educated at Harrow. He has a, an extraordinary sense of his own personal destiny, that God has a plan for him, Charles Sturt. God doesn't have a plan for the people who work for him. They're just the instruments of Charles Sturt's divine mission. And he believes that he has been ordained by God to uncover the mystery that lies at the heart of Australia, to draw back the veil, as he keeps saying, to reveal the mystery beyond. And that mystery, he believed, would be an inland sea. And, uh, but as I, as I say, the, the, the more common view is the view embodied in this, this map, uh, which was published in um, about 27, uh, uh, which shows both a lake which you could say is an inland sea, but more importantly, or as importantly, a big river, which flows out there sort of near Broome, really, uh, the Great River. And we'll just zoom in on that uh, feature. Uh, and it says, you can see written along the bottom of the lake, the Great River or the Desired Blessing. So that's what, uh, that was the majority view, that we'd find a river like that. Um, anyway, uh, Sturt goes off uh, into inland Australia. First of all, he goes down the Darling, that, that, that green water that's there is the result of um, salt water that's in the ground, gr saline groundwater leaching back into the empty river. It's not the dried up puddles of river water, it's the, all that water's gone and this is groundwater that's come back. Darling travelled along the river and looked just like that and he believed that this was evidence that he was approaching an inland sea. Here's the next twist. Sturt thought that his inland sea was going to be salty and he thought that he was coming closer to it, and this was some kind of sump from the inland sea. And then he realised, actually, that this water was indeed leaching from under the ground, and, uh, and he turned back disappointed. Anyway, in his next uh, expedition, he goes off into central Australia in search of the inland sea again, and ends up on the sand dunes of the Simpson Desert. Imagine him standing there on that red sand dune with a boy for company, gazing out towards the horizon, and the sand dunes go on forever. This is the place God has brought him to. This is a man with a profound belief that the Lord Jesus Christ is his salvation and his redemption. This is a man who believes that the Holy Spirit walks with him and talks with him, that God the Father has ordained him to stand in the middle of Australia and proclaim the mystery to British people that lies there. And when he gets there, there's nothing there. He's the one who places on our agenda the idea that that is a place of death-like silence, picking up Oxley's term and amplifying it a thousandfold. I'd like to talk to you also about Major Mitchell, but I'm not going to have time. Um, I would just say this about Mitchell. Mitchell is a man of quite different inclinations. Mitchell's often pilloried as a kind of... Um, sort of unsmiling imperialist who, who stood on mountaintops and appropriated the land using language and maps from the Aborigines. I just want to read you something from Mitchell. This is what he wrote about Aborigines. The only kindness we can do for them is to leave them and their wide range of territory alone. To act otherwise and profess goodwill is hypocrisy. We cannot occupy their land without producing a change fully as great to the Aborigines as that which took place on man's fall and expulsion from Eden. A complex man, Major Mitchell, a complex man. Uh, he continued surveying, continued drawing maps, continued imagining in his mind's eye how this land could be transformed by hydroengineering. Every time he, he, he rode into a, dry, uh, into a dry place, he, he, he described how we could build channels here and a reservoir there and how eventually we could irrigate this country. He wanted to do it, and yet in another voice he says, but we should go away because we're taking this land from people who will not benefit from our being here. A man with absolute classic 
um, contradiction at the heart of him. And if you're interested in that, I, I, I recommend that you also look at the, 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 rec the writings of Edward Eyre, another famous explorer. If you just go to the, um, the Guggenberg Library online and just find the writings of Edward Eyre um, and look, look for his remarks on Aborigines and his journal, you'll be astonished by what you find. Anyway, my, my, my claim is that in Australia we can map silence that there is a zone beyond which people enter the silence and where it won't disperse, and that the map of silence... Uh, there we are. There's, there he is standing, talking to his death. That's what the death-like silence looks like. There's Mitchell. And there's the map of silence. That once you go beyond the, into the arid zone, you've entered this place of death-like silence. Now, the argument of the water dreamers is that dealing with that fact preoccupies Australia for the next 50 years or so. There are many responses to the idea that the centre of Australia is a place of death-like silence. The first response I've called necronationalism. Necronationalism is the idea that death holds the secrets to who we are. And the two great apostles of necronationalism, apostles of silence are Ludwig Leichhardt, who, while crossing the desert, disappeared, and his mystery is somehow said to be absorbed into the landscape itself. And, of course, Voss is based on Leichhardt, a story of how, in being annihilated by the land, a man reveals great truths about himself and about the country in which he's disappeared. Uh, equally powerful is the mythology of Burke and Wills. You know, why, were Burke, why do we make Burke and Wills into heroes? Well, it's often said that they were made into heroes because we love failure. Well, we don't love failure. It's nonsense. Um, Australians like to win. Burke and Wills have been turned into heroes because they died, because they died in the wilderness. And it's as if they and Leichhardt have been received into a great mystery, that by passing beyond, they know things that those of us, those of us who are left behind don't. Anyway, what happens is that, that Burke and Wills, um, as you know, go out, they, they cross the continent, they come back and they, they die through their own incompetence. And the people of Melbourne decide to turn them into heroes. And they hold the most out-of-scale um, funeral for them, based on a kind of royal funeral that occurred in London uh, recently. And thousands of people turn out and weep and they all subscribe to this enormously flamboyant uh, funeral for them. Um, in fact, what happens is their, their bones are brought back and they're laid in state. And by this stage, the, the, you know, they're just corpses, they're, they're, they're skeletons, and dingoes have eaten bits of them. There's part of Wills' faces is missing and Burke's hands and feet are gone. And they're put into uh, glass coffins and laid in the buildings, uh, the, the rooms of the Royal Society in a sort of Arthurian chamber with peacock feathers and black drapes and things. Uh, not everybody thinks it's a good idea. The, the Melbourne examiner complained that the spectacle was anything but edifying. And the age just said it's indescribably disgusting. <laughs> but there they are. Now, just to get a sense of how powerful this idea is, I want to show you this. This is, if you've been to Melbourne, you'll know this statue. It's right in the middle of town. And it's, a, it's the most valuable statue to date that had been erected. It, it's, it's raised by public su subscription. And I've often shown it to students, and I always call it Michelangelo-esque. And... Um, I was about to talk about that. About a year ago, I was going to show this, and I was going to use this word Michelangelo-esque. I thought, what's a stupid word to use? It sounds pretty poncy. Why do I say Michelangelo-esque? I mean, it's a piece of Victorian public art. Of course, it looks, you know, it imitates Renaissance models. What, what am I carrying on about? And then, I, for some reason, I thought of Moses. I thought, Michelangelo and Moses. I wonder why I'm thinking about that. So I Googled Michelangelo and Moses. And that's what came up. Now, which shows you that there's something, some knowledge in my subconscious that, uh, I mean, that face, Charles Summers, who did this very marvellous sculpture, is a classically trained sculptor. He knows the, you know, the great tradition of, of his art form. He knows this, paint, this, uh, this important sculpture. It's not as if it's an obscure piece. He's clearly modelled the head on Moses and he's clearly modelled the, the sitting posture of Wills, that's Burke standing up and Wills sitting, the, the, the seated posture of uh, Wills on the seated posture of Moses. Now, why would you model it on Moses? Well, Moses is the man who leads the children of Israel through the desert and who dies in the wilderness before the children of Israel reach the promised land. 
So it's an extraordinary, I, I think almost sacrilegious, veneration of Burke and Wills as, um, well, sacred figures. Let me just talk a little bit more about necronationalism to give you a feeling, a sense of, of um, how powerful I think this idea is and how it continues to have a hold on our, our imaginations and then um, f- end by talking about the great challenge to it, the water-dreaming challenge. I, this necronationalism or never-never nationalism, you could call it, reaches its logical and suicidal conclusion in the writings of a young Sydney man named Barcroft Boak. His, uh, he got very depressed, Barcroft Boak. He, he, he was a drover. He, he lived in Sydney, but he left Sydney and went out and became a drover. Got very down. And he wrote the great necro-nationalist classic, Where the Dead Men Lie, which I'm sure you know. But let's look at it carefully. Published in 1891. Out on the wastes of the never-never... That's where the dead men lie. That's where the heat waves dance forever. That's where the dead men lie. That's where the earth's love suns are keeping endless tryst. Not the west wind sweeping, feverish pinions can wake their sleeping out where the dead men lie. Ask to the never sleeping drover. He sees the dead pass by, hearing them call to his friends the plover, hearing the dead men cry, seeing their faces stealing, stealing, hearing their laughter peeling, peeling, watching their grey forms wheeling, wheeling round where the cattle lie. Now, that poem, and it's got many, many verses, that poem, which has entered the canon of uh, Australian poetry, is, if you look at it, honestly, a very, very disturbing and perhaps unhealthy um, way of experiencing the world. Barcroft Boke, you won't be surprised to learn, committed suicide in his 20s. He went to Folly Point and hanged himself from a tree there using his stock whip as a noose. The symbolism is chilling, isn't it? And I suppose the great... Um, the greatest and most famous spokesperson for this necronationalism is Henry Lawson. Now, this stuff hasn't died, you know. I mean, you think about Picnic at Hanging Rock. Picnic at Hanging Rock is published in the 60s, made into a movie in 72 or 75, whatever it is. Um, what's the story? A group of schoolgirls goes on a picnic at Hanging Rock and they disappear. And we are to presume that they've been killed and there's actually a bit of an implication in the movie that they've been sexually molested in some way. There are kind of men lurking around at the edges of the story. They've certainly died. But the story wants us to, and the film, wants us to believe that somehow they've passed into another dimension, just like Burke and Wills and Leichhardt, that they've been received into the mystery of the land. And that you remember there's a little fat girl called Miranda who's, you know, you remember Piggy and... Um, uh, what's the book called? Um... The Lord of the Flies. You remember Little Piggy in Lord of the Flies is the fat kid who, who, who can't play. Well, Miranda, Miranda, not Miranda, um, Miranda's the beautiful girl who takes them away, but there's a girl who's left behind, and she's the one who goes, Miranda, Miranda, don't go. And, and the book says that the awful silence closed in and, and claimed them, and, and she's left uh, all alone, the little fat girl that nobody wanted. So that we're supposed to believe that something sort of beautiful and a little bit sexy had happened to those girls. I mean, you think about it, it's sick. That girls who died on a picnic. Nothing beautiful happened at all. That's how powerful this necronationalism mythology is. Things start to change at the end of the 19th century with the discovery of the Artesian Basin. There it is there. And uh, the arrival on the scene of the great water dreamer, Alfred Deakin. Now, Deakin says, and this is what the water dreamers say, don't talk about silence. Don't talk about deserts. There's no such thing as a desert. It just looks like a desert. But what's really out there is a garden. And we know it's a garden because on the rare occasion that it rains, all this stuff grows. They think of the desert and even of the bush as a big sort of bowl of nothing where nature is absent. And they say that in order to bring life into the middle of Australia, we need hydroengineering. So at the end of the 19th century, the hydro-engineer is the liberator of nature, the bringer of nature and life to a barren land. 
That's what water dreaming is. The belief that you can transform this country by replacing the absence of nature or compensating for the absence of nature with uh, engineering. Now, I'm just going to scoot through some slides because I've, I've indulged myself a bit here and because I want to make a point about the dead heart. In 1906, Professor Gregory, who's an Englishman briefly stationed at the University of Melbourne, publishes a book based on a field trip he'd taken in 1903 with a group of students to the shores of Lake Eyre. He clearly didn't have the same insurance worries we have today. (laughs) He took a whole lot of them at high summer, for heaven's sake. And they did a kind of survey of all the plants and animals and Aborigines and so on they found there. And he wrote a book in which he describes Central Australia as the dead heart. And by the dead heart, he literally meant uh, that this was a place with a heart, there it is, that had died, and that all those rivers and creeks that flow into it were dead and withered arteries. Now, think about this. This is a a federated Australia, an Australia that's in search of its national meaning, its national purpose. And along comes this joker and says, do you know what, you Australians, you've got a dead heart. The heart muscle that has ceased to beat. This is absolutely fuel to the fire, or water to the mill, uh, for the... um, the necro- for the, uh, uh, the water dreamers. They turn on this image as if this Englishman has besmirched Australia and insist that we've got to engage in hydroengineering on a really, uh, a really massive scale. Now, the reason that they do this is because they are frightened that Australia is unoccupied, that the middle of Australia and the north of Australia are unoccupied. Remember Terra Nullius? Terra nullius is the principle that if you don't occupy the land, someone else can take it from you. Now, by declaring the land terra nullius in in the 19th century, the white authorities are often accused of um, being self-serving and hypocritical. Well, they were certainly self-serving, but they were not hypocritical. White Australians believed at this time, most did, that the rule of terra nullius was a rule of history, that if you didn't occupy the land, someone else would take it from you. And after 100 years, we white Australians, having taken the land from the Aborigines, had failed to occupy it. And we could expect the Asians, the cunning Asians, who were you know, good at living on the smell of an oily rag or a drop of water, that they would come down and take it from us. So hydroengineering becomes a matter of defence. You've got to believe in this stuff if you're really an Australian. You're not being true to your country if you say it can't be saved. From this university, in strides, Professor Griffith Taylor. Griffith Taylor, the greatest geographer we've ever known, who publishes a map of Australia that looks like that. <laughs> the Western Australians are so outraged, they ban his books. They ban from the universities and the schools. And he's vilified in Parliament for being un-Australian. And he says, mate... Well, he doesn't say mate because he was a rather pompous fellow. He says, gentlemen, you're confusing patriotism with rainfall. But uh, it's so unpopular that he's forced to leave the country and he goes off to an illustrious career in North America and doesn't think <laughs> any more about it. But he defiantly continued publishing books with that map you know, on the title page, just to make a point, because he really believed we had to understand that the middle of Australia climatically is unavailable to us for development. You've got to understand that the population of Australia can only be measured by the coastal fringe. Australia is its coastal fringe. Forget the rest. Working using Europe as, as a model, he worked out that the capacity of the coastal fringe by the year 2000 would be about 20 million people. Bang on. Well, as you know, uh, after the, uh, as we go into the 20th century, there are various schemes uh, to flood inland Australia. These are various turn back the river schemes, uh, including the Bradfield scheme there, uh, which were all about flooding the river. Here's a lovely one. This is a scream to dig a, 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 ch- a canal, a chana- what's it called? A channel, canal, from uh, Spencer's Gulf up to Lake Eyre. And see, it would turn into a green heart. See how lovely that is? <laughs> uh, and uh, everything would get fertilised uh, with, uh, well, water, salty water. Of course, the problem with that is that the water would evaporate at such a rate that you'd just get more and more salinity. You'd get more and more concentrated in land Australia. It's the worst thing you could do is let the water in there. But we do have a problem. That's what the Murray normally looks like. That's the Murray mouth. That's what it looks like today. And uh, we do have a serious, a serious issue on our hands. I want to end by making this point. If you'd asked Australians any time between 1900 and 1960 what was in the middle of Australia, they would have said Lake Eyre. 
Lake Eyre was the dead heart of Australia. It was the cruel joke that geography had played on us. It was the withered sump of Charles Sturt's great dream, the inland sea that wasn't. It was a symbol of disappointment. Ayers Rock, as we used to call it, did not appear in the centre of Australia until 1960. We didn't call it the centre until 1960. And that switch from Lake Eyre to Ayers Rock is a fundamental change of heart for Australians. It's a shift away from a geography of disappointment into a geography of hope. A belief that what lies at the heart of our, of our country is beautiful, that it can be affirmed, that it's spiritual, and increasingly that it has a kind of Aboriginal quality of which we can also partake. It is the most important change of a consciousness that has occurred in this country and a great, um, a great uh, basis on which to build hope for the future. Uh, that's where I must end because I've gone way over time. Thank you very much.